Hey everybody, as promised, this is the full interview that I recorded uh, recently with Dr. Becky Smethurst, who appeared on Monday's video about the cosmological crisis. Dr. Becky, as I said uh, in that video, she is a PhD astrophysicist who works at Oxford. She focuses mostly on black holes. So we talk a little bit about that, we talk a little bit about uh, what it's like just to be an astrophysicist and, and what the scientific community is like to kind of be a part of that. And of course, we go in depth on the cosmological crisis, which is what Monday's video is all about. Far more in this one than you saw on Monday. And I'm going to do the thing where I put the time codes down in the description. So it should show up in the timeline so you can see what we're talking about, the different parts. So if you don't want to sit through the whole thing, you can just go to the part that's interesting to you. I am also uploading the audio only version of this to my podcast. I do have sort of a podcast that's been sitting out there for a while. I haven't really been using it, but I, I do plan to start uploading audio versions of the videos uh, to that. I've gotten a lot of requests for it and there's just no reason not to. So I'm going to start doing that. But any kind of long form interviews that I do, uh, like the most recent one that I did with David Quammen, uh, you know, I always upload those there. So you can go check those out if you want to just capture it in listening form. Listening form? I think it's called audio form. But anyway, this was a lot of fun. Dr. Becky was, was uh, a blast to talk to, and I'm glad I got a chance to do that. So I'm happy to be sharing this with you. Please enjoy it. Please go check out her channel and subscribe to it because she does a lot of really awesome content in a lot more professional way than I do. So anyway, one last time, thanks to Dr. Becky for taking the time to uh, chat with me. And with no further ado, here is my full interview with Dr. Becky Smethurst. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll do the Dr. Becky Smethurst. Hello. <laughs> Did I say that right? Did I say your last name? Yeah, right? you said it perfectly, actually. Okay. You're the I was actually first one that's like ever got that right first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was debating, like, do I call you Dr. Becky or is it Rebecca? Because your email was Rebecca. No, it's just the university being like, we will give you your full name. <laughs> <laughs> you will sound professional, damn it. Yes, even though it's only my mom that calls me Rebecca when mm. I've done something really bad. You know that sort of like shout of the name up the stairs where you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you had to put Rebecca. your middle name in there, that's when you know you're really in trouble. Yeah. That's, oh, that's when the, the college is like, no. No. University. <laughs> so, so you are a, a PhD astrophysicist at Oxford. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I'm now what's called a postdoc. So I've done my PhD yeah. and I'm now hired to do research there. And uh, basically a research fellowship, which is where they're like, we have some money. What research would you like to do? And I was like, black holes and galaxies please and they were like okay <laughs> off oh, you go so cool. <laughs> it's so cool it's so much freedom um it's amazing it's such a cool position that they let you just you know it's almost like the idea of blue sky research like you know ask whatever questions you want to ask and let's see where mm. it goes so it's it's really nice good oh, position cool. to be in well i i was gonna ask like what is a day in the life of an astrophysicist and then i <laughs> and then i got on your channel and you had a video exactly like that so i was like i'm not gonna ask that <laughs> because i know i've done videos of topics or that that question that I just keep getting asked like that and then people yeah. keep asking the question I'm like I made a video about it so I didn't <laughs> want to just straight up ask you that but in that video it, that was like a 15 hour day yeah that pretty much but that was like a no that was a I picked a really busy day okay. um but I also picked a day where there was something going on in the evening so it wasn't just like I came mm. home and watched Netflix for <laughs> two hours um yeah so that was like an evening where we had like a a public lecture and we had like a, a dinner in, in one of the colleges in Oxford afterwards as well, which was really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that whole day was basically just like you say from people always asking like, what do you actually do? Like as, as an astronomer, yeah. as an astrophysicist, because they always assume that all you do is like use telescopes and look through telescopes. And I'm like, actually I, I maybe do that like once or twice a year. Like if I'm lucky, uh -huh. like it was a good year. Um, but like, otherwise I'm just data crunching, you know, yeah. and it, it's, it's trying to show that on screen without, you know, just me being sat at my computer all day. It's a difficult, <laughs> so. But I, I imagine it, it takes a, a personality of somebody who just really loves crunching data. A to, little bit. Yeah, all definitely. Or like someone who, who loves coding or someone mm. who really likes doing a lot of maths, for example, but there's lots of different, you know, like fields. So I'm very much like a, a person who uses data from telescopes, whereas a lot of my friends, they do simulations on computers, like on these big, you know, yeah. like clusters of computers. And so, and then you have people who do like theoretical astrophysics as well. And then, you know, like traditional at the blackboard kind of people doing the math crunching. So there's lots of different like strands within astrophysics. That's why people always ask me like, oh, I'm no good at math. Can I still do astrophysics? And it's like, well, 
if you said to me you were no good at violin and you wanted to be the first chair violinist one day, like I'd be like, just practice, you know, that's yeah. all you need to do is practice, practice, practice. And it's the same kind of thing. Like you need the maths to get you to where you want to be. I don't really use a lot of maths in my everyday job anymore. There are some mm. who do, but I don't really. Uh, regular viewers of my channel are probably laughing right now because I did this whole bit about math versus maths. <laughs> I've seen that way. You okay. just pop up and you go maths <laughs> with my, with my T. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Every time you do that. <laughs> we, we don't one have thing to fight I'll, about that or anything. No, that's right. They're always, I always, people always pick me up on that when I say maths, but also I think people aren't used to hearing accents like mine on YouTube. Like I get told I sound like Maisie Williams and I'm like mm, 300 miles further north than that. Um, yeah. I think the, the closest person is Sean Bean, except he's from Yorkshire and I'm from Lancashire. So it's like oh, okay. rivals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like people always put me up on how I say Saturn. Mm. Because with it, the, with I, the just, drop T. I just don't say the T. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, and then uh, dust. My favorite well. was listening to Russell Brand say the word entity. He pronounced <laughs> it. Think- it and eight, yeah. I don't oh think my, I'd do that. Wow, too, that's, there's no consonants <laughs> at all in that. But I was having yeah. this conversation with somebody that we're on a rabbit hole now, but whatever, mm-hmm. uh, uh, about, about how many different um, accents there are in England. Yeah. For such a small place, there's so many different accents. Mm-hmm. I mean, did so, you guys just not communicate at all for like hundreds of years or? But, no, it, it's really close. So I went down another rabbit hole uh, ages ago reading up on this because like, I come from the Northwest near Manchester mm-hmm. and within maybe a 60 mile radius, you can probably find thousands of different accents. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous, right? You know, 10 miles down the road, they sound different from me. Yeah. So I read up on this once and it's literally, it's, it's just the fact that people... I don't want to say evolved. That's my physics brain coming out. But, you know, they evolved separate to each other in towns that, yeah, okay, we're only 10 miles apart. Sounds like nothing to us now. But back then was actually, you know, like a day's journey. So people wouldn't make it very often. So it just shows the fact that uh, language evolved in isolation in the UK as opposed to in the US where there was much more movement and mixing. Mm. So I think it's really cool. I think it's cool. I I read that that the British accent where where you drop your R's at the end, Mm -hmm. um that came later like that was a thing that was kind of brought up when what it wasn't victorian times but it was something like that but but apparently like the southern u.s the the southern drawl from the u.s over here orange like yeah like like that's more similar to what like maybe the original british that came over to the colonies spoke like Mm. yeah i I read that somewhere and i thought that was super interesting i always think australians sound liverpudlian to me oh yeah I just hear it. It's the way they go up at the end of the sentences. Mm. And I always wonder whether there was a big colony of people from Liverpool that <laughs> they <laughs> just all Beatles fans. Like, maybe. <laughs> well, so getting back to the, uh, I know that was a fun little rabbit hole. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, getting back to the whole like academic world that you live in. I feel like there is sort of like a, for lack of a better word, like a veil over it for people who don't live in that world. Um, yeah. It can, what, what is something that, that gets what's what's a lot of what's something that people mistake a lot about kind of doing what you do so i think the biggest misconception is like who does the science when people think of academia they think of university they picture an einstein-esque person right they picture the old white guy with crazy hair and a lab coat stood by a you know a blackboard and stuff mm-hmm. and it's just not the case at all it's just the most diverse mix and group of people um and I wish that people could see that that's what happens every day. And there's also, you know, I think people think of it as, as being sort of like, Oh yes, jolly good show, you know, kind of thing. Like you're right. Well done. Good friend. Uh-huh. And like, it's, it's more kind of like, Oh my God, I'm so stuck on this. Like, Oh, like I, I'm, I've been stuck for weeks. I don't know what to do. Like there's, there's so much more of like not knowing the answer than there is knowing the answer. Mm. And I think, don't think that perception comes across a lot. Um, you know, we come across as like either scientists know everything or the boffins are puzzled again. And it's like, well, most of the time we are puzzled. Yeah. Otherwise yeah. we'd all be out of a job because we know everything already. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I was going to ask, uh, you're familiar with the Dunning Kruger effect, right? No, I don't think so. Uh, okay. So <laughs> it's a different name, but maybe it's a, maybe it's just a very American thing. I don't know. But uh, it, it's the idea that like the less you know about something, the more confident you are. Yes, yes, yeah. I have heard about this. Yeah. Um, so th- this is what I always say. So actually, what they say is like, there's, if you follow the 
amount of that you actually know about something like your, your confidence goes way up at first. And then the more you know about it, you realize how much you don't know. So it dips way down into this valley. And then the more you become an expert, it goes back up again. So there's like this kind of deal, mm. kind of like a U shape. Um, so as somebody who covers a lot of different types of topics at a very shallow level, I research everything just enough to know how much I don't know about it. So I just kind of live in this valley down here of like, I'm an idiot. I don't know. But um, I imagine somebody with a PhD in astrophysicist, astrophysics, see, I can't even say the word. Um, like you would probably be a bit more on the other side of that curve. Like, do you feel like that? Or is it more like you just kind of keep coming up with more questions and you feel like you never quite get there, you know? Yeah, I think you kind of maybe after you hit the valley, it's just a constant sine wave of up and down <laughs> and up and down again as you publish a paper and then you uh, go and ask another question, then you publish a paper and then you ask another question. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it's a little bit difficult, like you say, like researching stuff at such a level that you get in that valley, but then you're trying to get people who watch the video to be up at peak, right? Mm -hmm. And then as a PhD, yeah, okay, you do get to that point for your very specific thing that you do, right? Have you ever right. seen that diagram where it's like the boundary of human knowledge is a circle and a PhD is like a little... A little... Blip, little, little blip, like that's, yeah, yeah I, that's I, your actually, contribution. I love that, that analogy. It's, it's great. Yeah, exactly. So I think if you were to... I'd be firmly in the valley for a, you know, a lot of more general physics concepts of like, oh, I, I've understood too much and now I'm like, none of this makes sense. And I'm only trying to make sense of my tiny little bit, which yeah. is about you know how supermassive black holes and their galaxies like interact and i can some days convince myself that i'm like yeah we got this and then some days imposter syndrome just takes hold right where sure. it's like what are you doing here like you know nothing and then you have to remember that nobody knows anything so it's fine yeah. <laughs> it's, it's refreshing to know that even you have imposter syndrome yeah i think we me and my at least me and my close colleagues anyway are always talking about it and, mm. you know, one of us can walk into this office and be like, I'm just, I feel like, you know, I, imposter syndrome is overwhelming today. And the person will just turn to them and be like, you did this, 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 and this, you're a boss. And you're like, <laughs> okay, yeah. And then you walk back out little, again. So a little therapy circle there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. At least you got, at least you have a, a social, um, uh, uh, underpinning there was the word I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. Maybe structure. that's another thing that people don't have, have an assumption about with academia is that everyone's really antisocial and it's like, the lone yeah. hero scientist and it's just not that way at all it's so collaborative and everyone is just like supportive of each other's work at least that's how i've always felt in academia just because everyone wants more science to get done so you know it, yeah. it's a really really nice environment actually and it's it's sort of yeah. like you, you found your people almost so i mean i i can't say that i'm like deep in that world or anything but i've doing what i do i've, I've met you know my handful of scientists but they have been very social and outgoing and um, more social than me. <laughs> you know? And when you think about it, it makes sense because that's kind of the, the, the nature of science, peer review and, you know, hashing yeah. things out and stuff. And also working as a group, right? You're going to hire mm -hmm. the people that, you know, you want to work with that you, you can also for P like PhDs, it's three years of your life, like three years in the UK, it's what, like five, six years in the US. It would take of like, 20 years, yeah. <laughs> of just like working with one single person, like your supervisor on mm -hmm. like incredibly detailed stuff. So you, you kind of have to get on with that person. So yeah, yeah. So what is it that um, you, you focus mostly on black holes and mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. What led so you to that? like what's... Black holes are just really cool. Well, of course. <laughs> so it's like I mean, favorite. I think have a more interesting answer than that. <laughs> but no, so I could, you know, I could have done like stellar black holes, which are the black holes that form at the end of supernova, but they're like piddly. So who cares about those? Um, <laughs> I care about like the supermassive variety, right? The time, the kind that we find at the center of every single galaxy in the universe. Um, and it's those things that excite me the most because they're like a million to a billion times more massive than the sun. And yeah despite the fact that they're so massive, they're, they're tiny in comparison to the galaxy, right? They can fit sort of in the size of the solar system in the center. And then, and then you've got a galaxy that's hundreds of thousands of light years wide around it. And yet we think that the supermassive black hole in the center somehow can stop an entire galaxy from forming stars. It can like take gas away from the galaxy. It can like funnel it in down the spiral arm so the black hole accretes it or you know, eats it up and grows mm. with it and takes away that gas the galaxy could have used to make more stars. And so it's, it's amazing to me to think that something so tiny can have such yeah. a huge impact on something that's so massive. It, 
yeah, that's why it, it just amazes me. And it's like, I'm trying to prove that that actually is happening, that like in galaxies with growing supermassive black holes, you can see that the star formation rate has dropped. Um, and uh, it, it's difficult, but it, I, I, I just love it so much. I love the fact that, yeah, okay, I can get really lost in my data one day and I can be like, oh, like, what does this mean? And it's like so deep in it that you, you know, forgot to even look up and check what time it is and you've skipped lunch by accident, that kind of a day. Yeah. And then when you do just sort of surface out of it, you're like, oh, that meant that this supermassive black hole was doing this to its galaxy. And it's like, it, it's sort of that reflection when you come out of that big hole full of like science and data that you've been in that you're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. That yeah. that's what I just did. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think it's really cool. Plus also I get to still, you know, observe and take pretty pictures with telescopes. Whereas things like cosmology maybe is you know, every galaxy is just a dot and they, <laughs> because they're so far away. And so yeah. they look a bit boring. And so I like that my field is very much like I use optical light as well. So I use light in the visible part of the spectrum so I can take images that I can actually sort of, I'd be like, okay, that's what it would look like if I could see my eyes were sensitive enough. And then also, you know, that it, it they're close by enough that I can see shape and detail and everything like that. So I think it's a, it's a nice balance of like really, really cool topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can actually go and take a nice pretty picture with it and see some detail. And it's the wavelength range that your eyes would also be able to see as well. Yeah. Like it's, it's the trifecta for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask the question. It's very rudimentary, but I mean, do, do we know what happens to stuff when it goes into a black hole? Just lots no. of information? Yeah, it's this whole, you know, we not, we're not entirely sure, A, what a black hole looks like because we'll never get information from it because you can't get light from it. Uh, you know, if it has any sort of surface, I get asked that question a lot as well. Mm. Uh, and then also like, what happens to the information that falls in. We know that black holes have mass though. So obviously they have like, there is stuff there and mm. whether that's pure energy by Einstein's E equals MC squared, energy and mass are pretty much the same thing. So I guess in my head, I sort of think of it as like when stuff falls in, it becomes this pure energy that's contained in this one space. And that has mass in that it like curves space time and mm -hmm. affects things around it. But it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have any form of shape that we're used to. You know, it doesn't have to be a sphere like a star, for example, you know, it, it could be anything. And, and I, I don't think we'll ever know to be quite honest. Mm. Um, even like gravitational waves, like we, even if that's a new way of observing the universe, like I don't think they can still tell us either. I think it, it's one of those questions that I'm like, I would love to know the answer to. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to say never say never, but yeah. I don't, our current understanding of physics, I don't think we'll ever know. Yeah. Uh, I, I did a video a while back about the theoretical possibility of white holes where, you know, mm -hmm. all that comes out the other side. Do you get asked yeah. about that a lot? Yeah. And people are like, why aren't, why aren't people taking this seriously? And I'm like, well, we are, but it's the theoretical people that are taking it seriously. They're coming at it from a purely mathematics standpoint, right? right? Math standpoint. <laughs> um, and, you know, they're, they're coming at it from, from the sense of what do the equations tell us that this yeah. would be? I'm obviously looking at it from a very observational perspective. Like, can we see something that looks like a white hole? And okay, like people argue quasars, which are growing black holes, but the material doesn't make it to the black hole. Uh, it gets mm. sort of stuck in the very much like pressure around it and it gets funneled by magnetic fields. There's these huge sort of jets yeah. that are super bright that we see as, as a quasar. Um, and people are like, well, that could be a white hole. And we're like, oh, it's not energetic enough to be a white hole. Like if it was a white hole, it would be, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it would, let's say 10 times brighter, 100 times brighter, you know, some, some yeah. factor brighter than quasars. And we just don't see that. And it, people are like, oh, we could be missing them. And I'm like, it's very doubtful we're missing the brightest objects known like, or in the universe. You know, I think that would be very, very <laughs> un unlikely. So, yeah. but I would say never, like I said. <laughs> yeah. Well, and plus the, the, the quasars, the, the funneling up of that energy, that was stuff that was around it. It's not coming out from inside of it, right? Exactly. But I think yeah. people's argument is that, well, you don't, you don't know that for sure. Um, but the thing is, we see those kind of similar things on smaller scales. We see them around those stellar black holes that are, are much smaller. They're only sort of like, you know, five-ish times the mass of the sun that 
after the end of a supernova, right? When you get these um, X-ray binaries and we see X-ray energy coming off these black holes mm. from this accretion process and, some, and the funneling from magnetic fields. So because we see it on smaller scales, it's much more likely to extrapolate it to the larger scales. And that's what's, that's what's going on. Sure. Cool. Yeah. And in, in, um, in the video where you were talking about the cosmological crisis that we'll get to in a second, mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about the smallest black hole. I guess it was November yeah. or so. Yeah, and actually happened. there's just been a, a recent uh, oh. announcement as well. Perfect. Yeah, right. um, yeah, yeah. so uh, LIGO, the gravitational wave detect mm -hmm. detected gravitational waves of a merger of a black hole that was about 26 times the mass of the sun, and then something else that is either the heaviest neutron star ever or the lightest black hole, mm. right? So I always say that a neutron star is like the Pikachu to a black hole's Raichu, right? <laughs> like at some point it will evolve and become a black hole if it right. grows big enough, right? But we don't know where that threshold is. Like what is the level at which neutron star Pikachu turns into black hole Raichu? Right. Um, and we have our best models of what neutron stars are doing and, and how the neutrons are resisting gravity, like what the pressure is between two neutrons that stops them sort of from... Um, collapsing down under gravity uh, and we have our models of you know when massive stars go supernova like how big does one have to be before it forms a black hole rather than a neutron star but again all of these are models right mm -hmm. they're our best models we have from observations that fit the data that we have at the minute and our sort of combining all of those things gives us like a limit for the heaviest neutron star and a limit for sort of the smallest black hole and this thing they found sort of sits right on that edge. And so it's really, it's really interesting to, to see yeah. like what people can conclude from uh, obviously all these different assumptions and models, what it actually is. Is there a name for that threshold? No, actually. Like, is it named after some No, person? no. It's something called neutron. It a name. Yeah, I think. It feels like that needs a name. Let's, let's name it now. Let's call it the Scott Smethers threshold. <laughs> <laughs> I don't belong on there. Okay. You were the it, one that it said yourself. it needed a name. <laughs> <laughs> the point that you're making was like, we always focus on the, the biggest thing, but you can mm -hmm. actually learn a lot more by looking at the, the, that smallest one because you can find that threshold. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. People are always obsessed with the biggest and the brightest. And yeah. they forget that actually sometimes if you focus all your energy on the biggest and the brightest, you'll end up with a skewed like perspective on what's going on and, and, and sort of the population of black holes or neutron stars mm. or whatever, of anything really. And if you don't look at the full range, you won't fully understand it. And so though the smallest things can be just as really as the biggest things. Yeah. As, as a former short kid, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm still a short kid. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So let's move on to the cosmological crisis because I don't mm -hmm. know how long this is going to take, but um, okay. So, the, the video is, is about this. Uh, let, me, let me throw out my understanding of it and you tell me how mm -hmm. wrong I am. Sure. So okay. it's basically about figuring out the size and age of the universe, right? Yeah, mostly the age. Okay. Yeah. And there's two different ways that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And one is using standard candles and mm -hmm. that's more local. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a CMB, which is older and... What, more distant? What do you call it? Universal. I universal. always want to say global, but obviously right. that's just it. So <laughs> universal. <laughs> but those two are not working together. They're, they're, no. they're actually getting further and further apart the more we... Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly what's going on. Yeah. So we're trying to measure the age of the universe and been trying to answer that question for a long time, you know, ever since the 1920s with Edwin Hubble, when he first measured the universe was expanding and we figured mm -hmm. out, well, if you can measure the rate and you can sort of rewind time, you can get how long the universe has sort of been alive for essentially. Right. Um, and we've been collecting evidence ever since, right? And people are often surprised when we say, well, you know, the, the most agreed on answer for the age of the universe or the best theory answer, because no one knows the answer. That's like science, right? It's, it's everyone's trying to get it the right answer, yeah. but no one knows what it is. And, you know, you collect evidence, you do an experiment, you take data, you analyze it, and then you obviously present it to your colleagues and you say, you know, I'm convinced that this means this, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to convince everybody else. And then that's how a theory becomes agreed upon, right? Because the evidence right. is overwhelming. The problem we have is like you say, we've got two broad methods at the minute for doing it. There's the way that Hubble did it 
measuring sort of supernova in distant galaxies that always go off with the same brightness. Mm -hmm. So that's why we call them a standard candle because they're something that's the same brightness wherever you put it. And so from its apparent brightness, you work out how far away it is and you work out how far the lights traveled and then you can get the rate of expansion. Right. So that's the one way. So that's one pile of evidence for sort of, I think it's around uh, 14 and a half billion years old. And then you have this cosmic microwave background, which is the echo from the Big Bang. And by studying that, and by looking at what we get today, you have to come up with a model that explains how we went from that to today. Hmm. And that's what fitting like a cosmology, when you come up with a cosmological model, that's what you're doing. You're describing hmm. how much stuff there is in the universe, uh, what the curvature, what the shape is, all this kind of stuff. And then you can see if it gives you uh, answers that match what we see in the universe today. And when you do that, you get about, say, 13.78-ish billion years, right? Around that kind of a mark. So 800 million years in it, right? Yeah, and there's yeah. everything that we do that's very local around us always comes out in sort of the 14 and a half-ish pile of evidence. And then everything that's done with the cosmic microwave background comes out in the 13.8-ish billion years evidence pile. And so we've got these two growing piles of evidence and everyone's a bit like, uh, <laughs> you know, what do we do? Yeah. So it's not very clear cut at all. And that's where the struggle is coming in, right? Is that people aren't really sure what, What's going on here and we don't know if it's going to turn out that there's something wrong with one pile of evidence or not and then that'll bring the, the two piles together or if there's some new physics some new hypothesis that explains why we're getting two different answers and if we can account for that new physics then that brings them together mm -hmm. um and so this is why it's been i mean this was dubbed a crisis in November 2019. I think by now we've probably all redefined what <laughs> definition of a crisis is. <laughs> um, but I dubbed it in 2020 this crisis in cosmology because everyone was either working with the two bits of data and sort of ignoring each other and saying, no, 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 the other team must be wrong. There must be something wrong with what they're doing. Mm. Um, or they weren't considering any necessarily new physics. But then after that paper came out, it really was sort of like a, I'll kick up the butt basically for everyone to, you know, say, okay, no, we, this has gone too far now. We need to actually figure out what is wrong here. And it's not like people haven't been searching for things that weren't quite right in the data. You know, they've been doing that for 10, 20 years now, especially with the cosmic microwave background data, checking that, you know, the measurements have been taking properly. There was nothing wrong with the analysis bit. And what they're searching for is what we call a systematic error, something that's consistently wrong that's going to shift your results somehow. Um, and they've not been able to find one so far. And so because it's been that long now with not been able to find one, I think that's sort of the, the supernova people were like, yeah, they'll just find something wrong with the data eventually. It'll be, you know, there's nothing wrong with ours. We've been doing this for hundreds of years, you know. Because <laughs> the CMB one is pretty new, right? Yeah, so that uh, comes sort of from the last couple of decades when we managed mm. to get microwave telescopes into space and we could get, which is sort of like the COBE satellite, the WMAP satellite, the Planck yeah. satellite have all done this. And so with that, we were able to get much more precise measurements that we needed. And the thing was, there was these two separate satellites, WMAP and Planck doing the same thing, and they both found similar <sighs> results. So that would mean they both had a systematic somewhere in their yeah. data as well. So it, it's pointing towards, it could be new physics that could yeah. bring those two evidence piles together. Are, are the scientists like falling into different camps? Like, yeah, is there a rivalry a going bit. on between the two? <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. There's a lot of people who, who might be, you call it cosmologists who are like, no, I, I, I've double checked what I've been doing you know, over and over again. And I know that this is fine. And so we'll fall into a designated camp. I think the rest of us are just kind of like sat back and watching the show and waiting for them to, sure. to decide. And we'll just keep saying, 14 billion years and just sort of plumbing for somewhere in the middle. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I think people might be slightly invested in what they're doing. And this is something you have to be really careful with in science is the idea of confirmation bias. And sure. um, that you go into an analysis or an experiment with a result in mind, that's like really, really, really dangerous. Um, and people are always often aware of that as well, which is why we're always searching for different ways of doing this. I mean, we said there's, there's two broad ways of doing it, which is like the supernova and the cosmic microwave background. But there's a couple of other different ways as well 
Um, for example, 2017, there was the gravitational wave discovery of the merger of two neutron stars that gave off light as well at the same time. And we got a, we got a Hubble constant measurement from that, this rate that the universe is expanding and therefore an age of the universe. And annoyingly, it sat right in the middle between the two <laughs> camps, which was mm, so annoying. Uh -huh. um, the same thing happened last year with someone who uh, used um, red giant stars as yeah, I was ask standard about that candles. Too. Yeah. yeah, that also fell right in the middle, uh, really annoyingly. Um, mm. There's also, we can do something called, um, use something called a standard ruler rather than a standard candle. So something that's the same size wherever. Um, and we do that with these things called baryonic acoustic oscillations, which are sort of like ripples in the early universe that then gave us the structure we see today. So made it so that more galaxies clump over mm. here and less galaxies over here. And with that, again, they, they fall into the sort of universal catalog that comes with the CMB, sorry, the universal evidence pile that comes with this, the cosmic microwave background. Um, and so it's interesting that, you know, the, we always want new ways of doing this and especially independent ways because the baryonic acoustic oscillations method is like reliant on the cosmology in the first place and so it's a little bit circular mm. um, and a lot of the standard candle measurements are all based on very local distances in the Milky Way that's sort of like the step ladder of being like oh because we know that distance we know that distance and we know that right. and so we're always looking for a completely independent way of doing it and so the, the gravitational wave one was completely independent which is why people were so excited about it and then right in the middle. Mm. So, so there's actually Several different measurements now then. Yes. Yeah. I mean, probably about uh, like seven or eight main ones. Yeah. Uh, and then people are always trying to think of like different ways we could do this. And, and they're all in conflict with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Fall into two camps, except the ones that sort of fall in the middle. But yeah, yeah they're all in conflict. Well, so my um, amateur science brain uh when i when i was hearing like that there's a difference between like local measurements and universal measurements mm -hmm. it, it kind of made me think of dark energy and the fact that you know if yeah. the space time itself is expanding then of course things further away are moving away even faster than the things that are closer um i'm sure that's been accounted for <laughs> in some way but like, does that factor into it in, at all or? yeah so we do take into account the fact that the, the distances it will, will appear quicker yeah. but there's also, so the analogy I like is the fact that if we look locally what rate the universe is expanding at, it looks to be expanding at a constant rate. But as you go more and more and more distant, we find it's accelerating expanding, which is right. one of the Nobel Prizes from back in the 90s. Um, and then this accelerated expansion comes from, obviously, from dark energy. Like you said, we don't know what it is. We give it a name. That's what's powering the accelerated expansion. Um, and so like that the fact that we see something different locally that, than we do universally people have said well perhaps that's what's going on here as well in terms of the age of the universe obviously that's all taken to, into account in the cosmological models but we're still getting these different ages out at the end mm. um, and the reason people have said this could be the case is because the milky way is actually in a really empty part of the universe it's in what's mm. called a void so you can picture the structure of the universe kind of like a like a sponge, I guess, with mm -hmm. sort of like all of the filaments and where the filaments cross over is where you get big clusters of galaxies right. and they sort of all have this big web structure. And the Milky Way is sort of plumb in the middle of a very, very, very empty region of space. And so people have said, well, that actually could be causing uh, the discrepancies here because we're measuring something in a very um, rare environment for the universe that's not typical for the rest of the universe. Um, and that was sort of, raised a couple of years ago now and people have been some people in favor and people have been trying to find evidence of that fact as well trying to show that sort of when you get out of this void you don't see this effect and we haven't found anything that supports that idea yet um but i think it's an interesting one and that it could be something yeah. that could explain yeah so so like just the fact that we're not around big super clusters of galaxies that like this the the gravitational Forces. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> my, my language fell apart there, but you get what I'm saying. No, yeah, I know yeah, exactly. So it could be that we're, yeah, we're just so isolated that we don't see these, these effects that are acting on other like matter in the universe and stuff mm -hmm. that could also then have an effect on the, the, the rate of expansion and everything. Because the rate of expansion is always about the sort of fight between whatever this force or energy that's pushing outwards and, and gravity pulling inwards. You know, if gravity had its yeah. way, the universe would just be one big amorphous blob of a galaxy of stars by the end of it, right? So yeah. um, it's interesting to think that because we're so alone that 
we could be we could be affected by the differing amounts of matter there against like dark energy. I have to process this. Yeah. Don't you think it's interesting that we keep finding out that there, our place in the universe is so weird? Yeah, as opposed a little to the bit. Rest of the universe? <laughs> Although I think like, you know, we, we went through a bit where like, oh, the earth isn't special, all the planets orbit the sun. Oh, the sun isn't special. It's not yeah. in the center of the galaxy. It orbits the galaxy. Oh, our galaxy isn't special because there's a, lots of other galaxies that look like ours. And then we got to like, oh, actually, we're in a weird place. <laughs> We so I guess it was, yeah, I guess it was kind of like a, a, a cookie at the end, right? Like, oh, mm. you went through all that, but it, it's fine. <laughs> like you are actually in a, in a weird place in the universe or at least an, a, not an, a typical place in the universe. Yeah. I don't know. I just, these are kind of totally different things, but like the, the rare earth hypothesis, I guess, is where my brain is wanting to go. But the idea that like um, we have only this one sort of um, data point in, mm -hmm. in terms of like what we, you know, what our perspective from, from living here and everything. And, and, uh, and we always want, we always want to assume that the rest of the universe is conforming to that same thing, but we, we kind of keep finding out that actually we're just kind of in a really weird place. And mm -hmm. like the, the moon that we have is like really big for a moon, for a planet. And just, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, I don't know, it's kind of going into the territory there, but uh Anyway, sorry, I just kind of went off to it. No, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of like exoplanet studies, yeah, the Earth is definitely uh, a special case. Yeah. But in terms of like place in the place in the galaxy, like no place in the galaxy, I'm sorry, place in the universe, we're not in anywhere like specific location special, except for the fact that around us happens to be empty. Mm. And it could be that like, you know, being in a fairly empty region of space did actually help life develop on Earth because it, right. it meant that like the sun was in a stable position for billions of years. So, you know, we haven't been torn out of that position, either flung out to the outskirts of the galaxy or flung to the middle where the supermassive black hole is um, yeah. by like encountering another galaxy. And so, you know, it's an interesting idea that maybe the void helped. Mm -hmm. So. And isn't it like if, if you go too close to the center of a galaxy, there's so much radiation that you probably couldn't have life form? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we talk about the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone mm. around a star, right? Where it's like not too hot, mm. not too cold. You know, you, you can have water and everything develop. But you've also got a, a galactic Goldilocks zone as well. So that region where there's not, as, there's not too much radiation from the accretion around the supermassive black hole. It's giving x-rays and radio waves and all sorts. And then there's also, you know, no um, intergalactic radiation coming from, from mm. supernova or gamma ray bursts or anything like that on the outskirts of the galaxy either. So we're sort of like in a little little bubble in the sort of yeah. suburbs of the Milky Way. That's interesting. My brain's starting to melt. I knew this would happen. <laughs> we yeah, haven't I, even talked about shape yet either. <laughs> I was just about to get to that too. That's the part that I really can't wrap my head around. Yeah. Okay, so let's just let's just go there. So um, in in your video you kind of seamlessly went from this whole thing into flat versus curved universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so help me out here. How does that how does that what's the connection there between those two? Yeah, so when we talk about cosmology, we're always talking about, you know, fitting this cosmological model to the data that we have. Coming up with the model that how much stuff is in there and and what shape is the universe so that we go from cosmic micro background to what we see now. And the the shape or the geometry of the universe is actually a big factor. Now there's a lot of evidence locally that says suggests that the the universe has what we call flat geometry, which means that if we set two parallel lines going, they'll never meet ever in the universe. They will always remain parallel. Um, and that's always sort of been one of those things that's fixed in a cosmological model. So it's a parameter that you don't allow to vary, right? When you're trying to fit everything and find what the best fit parameter is, you, do, you, you just fix that one so that it's flat. And that's because there's just so many parameters that you're trying to fit in these cosmological models that it's just like, if you can fix any of them, you, you fix them just to make it so that it's like, it's not overwhelming the amount of parameters and it doesn't like overfit things. Mm -hmm. But the paper that came out back in 2019, that was like crisis in cosmology, tried to fix the crisis by saying, okay, the universe doesn't have to be flat. What if the geometry of the universe was closed or had this idea of positive curvature, which would mean that if you set two parallel lines going, they would meet eventually mm -hmm. because of the shape that they're traveling over. So like on a sphere, like on earth, for example, longitudinal lines, they're parallel at the equator. 
they meet at the poles, right? So that was one thing they were saying. You can also have negative curvature would be like, um, like a saddle. So if you had two parallel lines on the top of a saddle where you sit and then you propagated them down, they would obviously then diverge, right? Right. People get very confused about this idea because there's a difference between geometry, which is what we were just talking about, whether it's flat or closed or open, we call it. So what the parallel lines are doing and topo like topology, topology. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm going to say topology. Um, and that is sort of the overall shape of the universe. So when people picture like, oh, curvature of the universe, they picture shape. So maybe they'll picture like um, the galaxies on the surface of a balloon as you're blowing it up, right? As it's right. expanding. Yeah, that's like the that's typical analogy. Goes. Yeah, exactly. And so people say, well, is that what a closed universe would look like? Because that's like, it's a sphere, right? And therefore that's the only thing that makes sense. But there's a difference between the curvature, the geometry and the topology, right? So I, I, I like to always show this with, okay, here's a, here's a flat piece of paper, right? Okay. Flat piece of paper, two parallel lines. You came with props. You I came with, I'm like Blue Peter. I, that's what I made earlier, okay. right? Like, these are my two parallel lines, right? They're, they're not meeting at all, right? This is, if this is the geometry of the universe, we can say, okay, this is flat. Its geometry is flat and its shape is a plane, right? Mm -hmm. But I can change the topology, the shape, right, into a cylinder. The two parallel lines still don't meet. And yet that would mean that the universe would be flat, right? Okay. And that frees people out because you're like, but it's not flat. And you're like, yes, but the geometry is flat, but the topology, the shape, gotcha. the overall shape isn't. And so when we talk about that the universe is curved or not, we don't necessarily mean the whole shape of the universe. So when this paper concluded that, okay, the universe could be closed, this positive curvature, it didn't mean that the universe was a sphere. It could mean that it was still any, any shape, right? You could, this is why people are fitting these like uh, Riemann manifolds and like hyperbolic thing, you know, the, what it, it was the other weird one where there's like a weird jug thing. that looks like a cornucopia. Like it, it, there's all these different shapes that you can have that still have these flat surfaces or closed or open surfaces. So it's a weird one to get your head around because your yeah. brain in just instinctively wants to picture something and no one can tell you what to picture, right? Because we don't know what the topology of the universe is. We have a good idea for the geometry. We know, well, we think it's flat, but it might not be. Um, and so this is why, like, you know, you can picture the balloon, but you know, you have to know that's just an, an analogy, right? The same, the same way when we describe general relativity, we say, picture like, uh, you know, like a bed sheet or a rubber sheet that's been pulled taut, right. you know, put a basketball on it, it depresses it, right? That's only in two dimensions. You've got to somehow picture that happening in three dimensions, which is yeah. incredibly difficult to do. It's a similar thing, right? It's, it's not something that you can necessarily picture, your brain wants to make it into something that you're familiar with. But that says that, therefore, this, this, the shape of the universe has to be something that you are familiar with that you've seen every day life, right? Which, mm -hmm. it, I, to me, it just it probably isn't going to be the case. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Well, like when you talk about being a curved universe, and I, I get the idea, like, if you're on a globe and, like you said, the longitudinal lines, they, mm -hmm. you know, connect. Um, but then I'm like, but does that mean that we are on the surface of a curved universe if it's, if it's curving like, because, or is it the whole thing? It's yeah. very difficult to <laughs> mm -hmm. visualize. Because that's like 2D as well. If you're just on a surface, yeah. you're on a 2D surface. The universe is at least 3D. It could be 11D according yeah. to some <laughs> theorists. Straight there, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it, again, it's, it's not something the brain can picture. It's like um, people often ask like, what was before the big bang? Yeah. And you're like, well, nothing. The universe was created in the big bang and the universe created everything. But as soon as the human brain tries to picture what nothing looks like, you're, you're picturing something, right? You're picturing empty blackness, but by doing that, you make it something. So right. it's impossible, you know, so it, it's almost like psychology, it's like psychological, I guess, right? Yeah. Is that you want to picture something, but it's not necessarily something that you can picture, which is why the maths, the math is, is so, you know, important with this. Um, yeah. And even though it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to, in terms of every day, it, it could make sense in terms of what we've observed. Yeah. Um, 
So as somebody who, who can understand the math, is it kind of like, you know, reading the matrix? You know, <laughs> a like little you bit. see the, the data falling and... A little bit, yeah. There are some papers that you read through where, you know, I like a short paper. I'm like 10 pages, a couple of plots, some nice figures, a pretty picture. Great. When I sometimes you see these very heavy theoretical papers, they're like 15 pages of maths, right? And it's just, we started with this equation and we've ended up here, right? And it took them 15 pages. And when you scroll, you know, you can really, really get lost in it. And it can feel like the matrix just trickling down. Um, and it's important to have that mathematical language, definitely. But it's also so important to be able to translate that. Yeah. Because if only the people who understand the maths can understand your work, then that idea isn't going to spread very far, for one mm. thing. Um, and I think that's why just like science communication is, is just so important. With to, within scientists themselves talking to each other, like being able to express like what your results, whether it's an equation or whether it's a diagram or a plot mean, mm -hmm. but then also like science communication to the public as well. Like, I think it's just so important that people understand a, that science doesn't know everything. That's the point of science, mm -hmm. but also that, you know, ideas will change and that's okay. And, uh, we don't always know everything and yeah. that, you know, you don't have to have done a PhD to be able to follow what the, you know, cutting edge of research is like. And I think that's why I started my YouTube channel, right? I wanted to be like the friendly neighborhood astrophysicist that you always wished you had, right? The <laughs> questions that you just can't Google because you won't find it on Google. The only thing you'll find is a bunch of papers from, you know, such yeah. a body at the University of Leicester in Cambridge or whatever, Yale, and, and you'll just be lost and because it, they're not so written for you. Here, yeah. yeah, they're just not written for you. That's the thing. Yeah. Scientific papers are written for other scientists. And that's why I think it's it's so important to to have someone who's both in the community, but has like one foot out of it to be like, oh, this is what this means, by the way. I was gonna ask you if you had some kind of background in, in broadcasting or journalism or any kind of communication no. background before this. No. Um, Cause you're, you're good at what you do. Thanks, and, I enjoy it, which probably helps, so. <laughs> well, so not, not to go on a tangent, but like, um, you are talking to somebody who has a Bachelor of Science from the University of North Texas in radio TV film, right? And then I somehow stumbled into science communication. And I, I always, maybe this is just me pumping up my own ego or something, but I like to think that if I'm good at this, it's because I'm, I am kind of a lay person. And, right. and I can kind of like bring it down to that level. I can dumb it down. Like if I can get myself mm -hmm. to understand it, that I can get other people to understand it, you know? Yeah. But um, I still feel the same way. Like, Well, but yeah. I feel like, I've even struggled with uh, people at your level, right? Getting it down to to my level, and and like it's it's a talent that not a lot of people have, and and you definitely have it. So that's why I was kind of nice. curious if you had a background in that. No, um, my mom always likes to joke that I did theatre, so she thinks that helps. Well, um, <laughs> you know, <that> well, <laughs> maybe, but like I hated like. English as a subject at school. I hated like writing and everything like that. And I think I probably would have loved to do like radio or TV at school. Cause like, actually my English teacher told me that the, I was bad at writing because I write the way I talk, but the way I talk apparently is a good thing. So I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, yeah, I disagree um, with that, but. <laughs> but yeah, like I, I guess my mom's going to hate me for this, but like, I always <laughs> picture my mom when I'm explaining something. So my mom didn't go to um, mm. college. She left school at 16 after what we call GCSEs in the UK. Um, mm. And she was into science. Like she remembers the moon landings and everything, but she says she never had the brain for it, which I don't think she did. I just think necessarily it was the environment that she grew up in or whatever. There wasn't like the drive to necessarily be academic. And whenever I'm explaining something, I'm thinking, will my mom understand what I have just said? <laughs> if no say it again <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh if, if she's the baseline and she gets it then i'm confident that the majority will yeah i don't think that's a mean thing to say i think that's that's no. perfectly accurate and and, <laughs> and and i think also maybe if you're thinking of your mom there's a certain you know love and affection that you have there 
and you put a little bit of extra love into, yeah. into what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's two that. people comes out and just see it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, one last thing, just going back to the, the cosmological crisis thing. Real mm-hmm. quick. Um, this might be a dumb question, but like, no such thing. Uh, I'll put it the most blunt way. Does it matter? Like, um, like what, what, how critical is this in terms of like, how much does this screw up other things? that we don't oh okay that's not where i thought that question was going i thought you were like why even bother like (laughs) why i mean you can throw that in there but i mean like we're we're talking about what what does it mean to science today that we don't quite know that eight hundred thousand or 800 million year difference in when sure yeah. yeah exactly um i think it does matter because for example my work is definitely like the evolution of galaxies and how they've gone from maybe not right at the beginning of the universe but like over the past billion years or so like what they've been up to um and for that you really need to pinpoint like what time things are going on at and you can't know the time unless you know the age okay and you can maybe do it like as a fraction like oh when the universe was you know 90 percent of its age today or something like that but it is really you know it's better to be able to put like a time stamp on it because you want to do comparative uh looking at things so that kind of has a a fall through point. Uh, if it did turn out that this paper in 2019, that f- this crisis in cosmology was started and it was actually 18 billion years old, that would have a huge sort of like ripple effect down mm. through the sciences. It would mean a lot of work that's been done before would have to be reanalyzed. And in some cases it probably would barely change the main result. And in some cases it could. Um, and so I think it is definitely important, like understanding the universe as, as a whole, obviously, does have ripple effects but in terms of like you know why bother in the first place um my thing is always like well just curiosity like why did we cross that ocean why did we climb that mountain like because you want to know right you want to expand the boundary of human knowledge but also i think the secondary thing is you just don't know what's going to come out of that kind of research right like Mm. we're talking about you know something that's so abstract to most people right is to looking right at the beginning of of the universe and and trying to figure out how it's evolved from then to now and fitting this huge big model with all these parameters that means something and yet by pushing to have say better telescopes or better ways of analyzing the data or better image reduction there are so many things that can that can come out of of that um so for example you know we always say that um digital cameras like ccds these these chips that go in digital cameras were pushed forward by astronomers being like we don't want to use film anymore it's not good scientifically you can't record the exact brightness of something you only record like in a you know, like a difference in brightness across a plate kind of thing uh and also you know better ways of um transferring data and wi-fi came out of that you know like that all came from astronomy and now we're in an era where especially in radio astronomy that they're taking data at a faster rate than they can get the data off the servers and onto their computer oh wow so (laughs) like that's just crazy, right? So that's going to massively increase the, the you know, because they're pushing like uh, computer people, can you sort this out? Because we, we literally can't get the data fast enough. That's going to increase, you know, data transfer mm. times, which I'm sure everyone will be happy for, you know, it'll speed up many transactions across the world in terms of sure. like finance or even calls like this. Um, and you can see a future where maybe, you know, we've got the James Webb Space Telescope going up. We've got these big 30 meter telescopes being built in Chile and maybe Hawaii, not sure how that's going to go forward. Um, And those telescopes will really contribute to the future of this field in terms of like seeing further things and seeing more distant things. But then how we analyze that data, the image techniques might go into medical imaging, or they might go into sort of like analyzing CCTV footage, you know, all this kind Mm. of stuff that astronomy really is an imaging science. So anything to do with imaging might somehow benefit from people saying i want to know the age of the universe which i think is a fun thing to say like you don't know necessarily and you can't call it now what it's going to be but indirectly they will somehow benefit god that's a great answer <laughs> no that that is a that is a fantastic answer um yeah. but that that leads me to a question that i was kind of curious about um future telescopes like are there any mm. that you just mentioned some right there but are there any that you're like super excited about are there any out there right now that are your favorite uh, well the hubble space what's your, what's your favorite a... toy 
<laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope definitely has a special well, place in my heart because, yeah. I mean, I was I was born like a month after it launched. So I'm like, <laughs> when it comes down, I'm going to be like, no, <laughs> we've been there since the beginning. Um, I'm excited for the James Webb Space Telescope launch. This is this one that's going to go, you know, millions of miles away from Earth. So we have to get it right on the first time. That's what's going to look. Right, Bill? Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, that's going to look back and be able to see hopefully like the very first stars that formed in the universe because um, it can see um, longer wavelengths than Hubble. So currently Hubble literally physically can't see that because it's redshifted out of what Hubble can see. And so that will give us an idea of what the very early universe looked like and help us constrain our models more. So I'm excited for that, but I don't think I'm def- like directly going to be using the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'm more excited for what's called the LSST, which is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is in South Africa, at the newly renamed Vera Rubin Observatory, which is very exciting. Um, and that is going to be like a, a survey telescope that scans the sky every night. And the numbers that come from this thing are ridiculous. Like... Mm. It was going to scan the sky every night and look for things that change. So people who do supernova studies or gamma ray bursts or anything that changes in the sky, they're going to generate something like a million alerts a night because something has changed and moved. This is why the SpaceX satellites is such a contentious issue because they're really yeah. going to pollute that, that sort of parameter in data space. Um, but also it's going to take images of galaxies too, which is what I do. So the previous survey that did this... 12, 15, 20 years ago now, uh, took images of a million galaxies. And LSST is going to up that to a billion. And so that might sound like, who, ne- who needs a billion galaxies? Like, who needs that many? But like, when you study pretty rare things like I do, which uh, maybe growing supermassive black holes in galaxies that are isolated, you know, things with growing supermassive black holes is like 10%. Things that are completely isolated is maybe even less than 1%. And when you put those two things together, you get down to really small numbers. So from that original million, we found a hundred hmm. of the things that we wanted to look at. So we're hoping that going up to a billion <laughs> bumps us up the thousand uh, mm-hmm. factor as well for the things that we care about. And then we can really get sort of big population studies on these kind of things. So I'm excited for that. And it's basically because it's, it's got a bigger telescope. It's got a, it's got a bigger dish, a mirror in the telescope. Mm-hmm. So it can see further and fainter things, but also it'll be looking at the Southern hemisphere sky as well, rather than the normal Northern hemisphere sky. So it's not like it's repeat either. It's sort of like we can add that original million to like the billion that it'll find as well. Oh, I got you. Yeah. You said it's South Africa, right? Mm-hmm. Africa. Africa. Cool. Yeah. yeah they're gonna... all in very, uh, like very nice places, telescopes. They're Hawaii, they're Chile, South Africa, Australia, mm. the Canary Islands. That's like, where do we want to go on holiday as astronomers? Let's put right, telescopes yeah. there. <laughs> the 30-meter uh, the telescope guy sent me this. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, cool, yeah, the Lego. Nice. I, yeah, I I'm excited put it together during too. a live stream, but it was way too complicated. <laughs> yeah, it takes days as well. Yeah, it took a while. Yeah. Oh, it's very but, yeah. overextended. Um, That'll be in Chile, and I I really want to go to Chile, and I haven't been yet. And I I really I'm hoping I'll get to it at some point. So you have to get acclimated to the altitude. I do, and I didn't do well at that when I went to Hawaii. Like I oh, was really? just like myoclonic jerk awake every time I tried to fall asleep. It was just um, like, no, you're too short of oxygen. <laughs> I just didn't sleep. I was like so grumpy for six days because I just hadn't slept at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm I'm from Texas, and it's super flat here. So if I if I go 10 meters up, I'm out of breath. So <laughs> and the humidity as well. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, I wanted to kind of wrap it up with a question that I'm, I wanted to, I want to pose this to a lot of people and you're the first one mm-hmm. that I'm posing it to. So maybe this okay. will become a whole thing later on, but <laughs> do you think there is an end to science? Like, do you think we'll ever know everything there is to know? No, I think it would be arrogant of us to assume that we could know everything there is to know. I think if there is ever a day where humanity declares, we're done, I I think that's a sad day for everybody because you can have the best theory that fits all the evidence, but then one day some new evidence could turn up that could shake the whole thing. That's either from, you know, something that's in a different sort of scale. Maybe it's like from the physics perspective, it's the smallest scale or the largest scale or the most energetic or the least energetic scale could change everything and could need Mm. something to be, to be tweaked. You know, in the way that like in the, when was it the 1800s, they were like, Oh, the atom will never be split. You know, to, to to declare that Mm -hmm. 
it, it is sort of similar to me of us saying like, we're done, science is done, we know everything. Because I honestly don't think we ever will. And I don't think it will ever be done, which I guess is a good thing because otherwise scientists would be out of jobs and we, we like having our jobs. <laughs> well, I, I feel like the nature of science is for everything that you discover, you bring up 10 more questions. Oh, you know? all the time. So it's almost yeah. like an exponentially growing base exactly. amount yeah. of, you know. So I guess another way of asking that question might be, do you think the amount of knowledge in the universe in general is finite? Or is it an infinite amount that we will never mm. possibly get? That's a different question. Okay, well then let's, let's talk about that question. Then. Do, do you think <laughs> like there's a certain amount of information in the universe that can be known? And will we ever, not will we ever get there, but like is, is it possible yeah. to know everything there is to know? This is almost a philosophical question. And it, yeah. uh, my brain keeps coming back to the idea of whether the universe itself is finite or infinite. Because if the universe <laughs> is infinite, then there's an infinite amount of knowledge to know. True. If the universe is finite, then it would be a finite amount of knowledge. In terms of like humanity, like there's always going to be history. So there's always going to be, like as time goes on, there's always more to know in that respect. But like mm -hmm. science itself, I would... I would say infinite because I think the universe is infinite. So, okay. yeah. Well, that's actually an interesting <laughs> way of looking at it too. Cause like as time progresses, history continues to grow. Yeah. So, and until time stops, there's no end to the amount of new knowledge out there. Oh, see, we just solved exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that would be history's perspective, but True. not a science like as sort of like physics, maths, like biology, chemistry computer mm -hmm. science who do i who do i have to keep listing before i offend anybody for not including them <laughs> i i don't know that 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 question came to my mind a while back and it's just something i've been thinking about here and there and i just thought i would pose it to different people and see what they had to oh, say about it's it. a great great question yeah i'm gonna be thinking about that all day you just gonna get random <laughs> tweets from me like in a week's time like right <laughs> i thought about it some more <laughs> well i mean in my brain it kind of framed like what what if there was like a super 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 advanced alien civilization mm -hmm. that had figured it all out mm. you know like is is that even possible i guess it was kind of like that was the jumping off point yeah i have we ever found them and they declared that i'd be like arrogant aliens <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were arrogant <laughs> yeah look at those guys <laughs> well to wrap up <laughs> i mean i'll point people to your youtube channel obviously but i mean is there any other place cool. that you'd like people to go to find out more about um, you and stuff you're working on or just for general I have a book out. People could, people could talk about my book. Yeah. When did that happen? Um, it was September for the UK, and then in the US it came out June second. So that is brand new too. over here. Tell me yeah. about the book. Uh, so the book is sort of like ten short essays on like the things I think you should know about in space. Like if you were ever at a dinner party with a bunch of astrophysicists and you were like. I need to, I need to know what they're talking about. Like this would be like the, the jumping off point. So it's a nice little sort of short book that like anyone can really get mm -hmm. into quite easily. Uh, and it's written at a level that like anyone can understand. Um, and so in the, in the UK and the rest of the world, it's called space, 10 things you should know. And in the US and Canada, it's called uh, space at the speed of light. Um, and it was really fun to write. So it's everything from like, you know, like dark matter, um to black holes to uh -huh. whether aliens exist um to whether we will ever be able to travel like outside of the solar system and there's sort of like 10 like the big ideas kind of thing that like you you should know if you're sort of gonna take a little jump into astrophysics so it is kind of like a space. Thing, uh, uh, giving people sort of a primer of how to talk to an astrophysicist. Yeah, a little bit. Like, you know, like the top level, like what's going on at the minute in terms of like what we think about, you know, dark matter and whether black holes or galaxies formed first or <laughs> why the night sky is dark, for uh -huh. example. Like understanding the like sort of like the basic like fundamentals of our understanding of like the universe and then the cool stuff we can then learn from them. I'm going to order that as soon as we get off of this. That's, that's super nice. cool. No, congratulations. Yeah. That, that's really Thank awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, really fun. And the US version has a lot of really cool illustrations as well um, that were done by this like amazing artist um, called Justin Van Gint. I can't remember how you pronounce his last name. <laughs> we'll put his name up on the screen. Um, it's good. Justin did some amazing, amazing illustrations for it, which are really nice. They're kind of like very reminiscent of like, 
the NASA like vintage exoplanet posters that they did. Um, like it has a very like cool like vintage vibe. Uh, I really like it. Oh, that's cool. So why did you have to do a different title for the U.S. and Canada or North America? The U.S. Publisher thing? publisher thing? Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand the publishing industry at all. <laughs> it just makes no sense to me. Um, so yeah, it was just the publishers thought that it would market better with that title. Uh, where should people go to get that? Uh, any local um, bookstore. You can write, you can request it from them if they don't have it. Um, but there's also, you know, the big bookstores like Barnes and Noble, that kind of thing. Online, right. big retailers will also sell it. <laughs> Google, go to Google. Google. Go to Google, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. I will have to like uh, send you an email about, I've been trying to work on some book ideas myself and I don't know where to start. So <laughs> nice. you've done it. So. <laughs> yeah, but now they wanted me to like write another one. And I'm like, no, I did it already. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> it just came out. <laughs> I guess that's better than them not wanting you to do another one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's cool. But they're also like, what do you want to write about now? And I'm like, black holes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Um, I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this, no, and, and I really, I really enjoy your channel. I'll be pimping it out and sending people over to it. And <laughs> thanks. Um, like I said, I, uh, I I cover these these things at a very surface level, and I do the best I can. But I mean, there are actual experts out there that really know what they're talking about, and you're one of them. And and you do a really good job of of talking at my level. Thanks. <laughs> you know? You're a friendly neighborhood astrophysicist, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks again to Dr. Becky. That was a whole lot of fun. Um, if you guys are interested, again, there is a audio only podcast out there. Um, it's just called the Answers with Joe podcast. You can search for it. It's definitely in the uh, in Stitcher and Apple podcasts. Uh, I don't know if it's on Spotify yet. I think I may need to click a few buttons to make that happen. But anyway, it's out there so you can check that out. And like I said, I'll be uploading audio versions of all the videos there from now on. So uh, go check it out. And let me know if you enjoy this kind of content. I'm in a place now where I can actually have access to some really cool people. So if you have any ideas, please do share them in the comments. And uh, who knows, maybe I could make that happen. But anyway, thanks again for watching. You guys go out there, have a great weekend, and I'll catch you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.